Good afternoon, uh, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, panel uh, on the Canadian context and opportunities in gene therapies. Uh, I name, uh, my name is Danika Stanimirovic. I'm Director of Translational Biosciences Department at the Human Health Therapeutics Portfolio. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I will be the moderator of this session. So we have uh, assembled really very esteemed and, and very knowledgeable panel uh, uh, to address uh, uh, key issues uh, uh, with quite a bit of experience in, in Canadian uh, uh, in Canadian context, and I would like uh, very briefly to introduce the panel members before uh, uh, we go into uh, uh, short presentations and then discussions uh, uh, on this topic. So we have uh, Dr. Michael Hayden, uh, who is a Kirian Professor of Medical Genetics at the University of British Columbia and Canada Research Chair in Human Genetics and Molecular Medicine. He is a senior scientist and former director of the Center for Molecular Medicine and Therapeutics at UBC's Faculty of Medicine. From 2012 to 2017, he was the president of Global R&D and chief scientific officer of Teva Pharmaceutical. Dr. Hayden's research focuses on genetic diseases, notably Huntington's disease, and along with his research team, Dr. Hayden has identified mutations underlying uh, lipoprotein lipase deficiency, uh, a rare genetic disorder, uh, and developed gene therapy approaches to treat this condition. And this became the first approved gene therapy in the Western world. So he is going to bring quite a bit of understanding on a uh, Canadian context of development of gene therapies. We also have, uh, as a panelist, Dr. Ronald Cohn, he is a president and CEO of the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Dr. Kohn joined Sick Kids in 2012 from John Hopkins University as the chief of the Division of Clinical and Metabolic Genetics, co-director of the Center for Genetic Medicine and senior scientist at the Sick Kids Research Institute. He was also appointed chief of pediatrics at Sick Kids and chair of pediatrics at the University of Toronto. His own research focuses on implementing genome editing technologies for the treatment of neurogenetic disorders and translating next generation sequencing into daily clinical diagnostics and management. On the uh, technology evaluation side, we have Dr. Morey Khan, uh, who is professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto and Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Health Technology Assessment. He is director of TETA, this is Toronto Health Economics and Technology Assessment Collaborative. He is a senior scientist and director of the Division of Support Systems and Outcomes at the Toronto General Research Institute. Uh, he is also a young scientist at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. And finally, we have on uh, uh, ethical and legal side, uh, Barta Maria Noppers, uh, who is a full professor and Canada Research Chair in Law and Medicine and Director of the Center of Genomics and Policy of the Faculty of Medicine at McGill University. She served as the Chair of the Ethics and Governance Committee of the International Cancer Genome Consortium and is currently Chair of the Ethics Advisory Panel of WADA. She was awarded the Henry Price and International Prize in Health Research, the Teal and McCulloch Award for Science Policy, and was appointed to the International Commission on the Clinical Use of Human Germline Genome Editing. So welcome all. Uh, uh, I'm really uh, glad to have this uh, uh, very sort of uh, strong, esteemed panel. Uh, and uh, before we start uh, uh, with the context and, and uh, uh, discussions, uh, I'm just going to give a couple of short um, uh, housekeeping notes uh, each panelist today will have about five minute presentation to set the stage for discussion. And I really strongly encourage the, the, the public and participants, uh, the audience to pose their questions and comments in the questions tab. As uh, perhaps the beginning uh, uh, of the discussions and, and maybe just to set some context around the, the panel discussion, I would also like to uh, introduce briefly uh, National Research Council's um, uh, uh, challenge program in disruptive technologies for cell and gene therapies. 
So this program uh, was launched uh, a couple of years ago uh, following government's mandate uh, and investment in trying uh, to uh, support uh, collaborative research uh, among uh, different stakeholders uh, in Canada, including NRC, uh, NRC's own capabilities, to start addressing uh, from perhaps more technological perspective, uh, uh, new discoveries and new disruptive technologies that can uh, uh, provide better uh, affordability and accessibility of these advanced therapies. However, uh, part of, of this mandate uh, is also to look into new collaborative models and to also address uh, existing gaps in, in Canadian ecosystem uh, uh, that uh, we identified uh, predominantly in areas of um, biomanufacturing uh, uh, of advanced therapies as well as in clinical deployment. So with that, mandate, uh, uh, we have launched the program with, with several uh, large-scale collaborative projects. And one of these projects is really trying to retrace the path of the first gene therapy developed in Canada, uh, uh, that was Glybera, and uh, uh, try to reinvent uh, not just the, the molecule or, or therapy itself to, to improve it and make it better, but also to make sure that we are capable of manufacturing these types of therapies in Canada and to deploy these, uh, uh, this new invented Glybera to Canadian patients in need. So with that, uh, I'm going to invite Dr. Michael Hayden to uh, speak a bit more about the uh, Glybera path and, and this uh, joint endeavor. Michael. Thank you, Danica. Uh, and uh, really delighted to participate in this uh, important symposium. What I'm going to do today is share with you the story of Glybera, um, how uh, this is really a very much a Canadian story with discovery and clinical development happening in Canada, then uh, essentially exported to another country for manufacturing, uh, with resultant uh, issues that led to this product essentially not being available to Canadian patients. You can see lipoprotein lipase deficiency is a rare disorder. Um, and what you can see here, it results in very significant morbidity. The plasma gets thick. Patients end up with severe pancreatitis. And we were initially able to define in Quebec, by the way, Eastern Quebec, the frequency is just a little very similar to the frequency of cystic fibrosis, so the highest frequency in the world. We were able to define the molecular uh, mechanisms underlying these, and there were just two mutations in Quebec uh, that caused the LPL deficiency. As a result of that, we started a gene therapy program using a gain of function mutation that was actually, we called it super LPL, uh, and, and this was done initially uh, here in Canada. We did all the preclinical work showing here you can see plasma from a large uh, animal model that had a spontaneous mutation, uh, and you could clear plasma using this gene therapy approach. Uh, and, uh, and then the clinical trials happened in the two countries where the mutations were defined, Holland and Canada, particularly in eastern Quebec, uh, where these trials were administered. Uh, and what you can see here is that eventually uh, this became the first gene therapy program approved in the world for adult patients with LPL deficiency. The trials showed that these patients had very little pancreatitis, no hospitalizations. And this was from um, a after the first gene therapy was approved. This was in 2012, and people were excited. Uh, what patients had said, and this is a patient who was public, uh, Madame Turcotte, who spoke from, um, from Quebec, and she spoke about what it was like, pancreatitis. She had been pregnant, couldn't become pregnant because of pancreatitis. What she was able to do is eventually have two children as a result of gene therapy, and she suffered debilitating pancreatitis hospitalized more than 40 times, and then was uh, uh, post-treatment, never had another attack. So this looked really good, the therapy, and this became approved 
in Europe. And then about a, a few years later, the drug was withdrawn. The drug was withdrawn because the manufacturing was very expensive. The cost of the drug in 2013-14 became a million euro. Uh, it became very expensive. It was not listed on formularies. It never went for approval in Canada. Uh, and the drug was withdrawn. And this was a, a, a real shame because it had real potential benefits for patients and this drug. And so as a result of the uh, um, Canadian program now, uh, um, we are now have a second chance. And we're collaborating with the NRC on an improved version of this. Uh, importantly, and uh, that we're gonna be manufacturing this uh, product in Canada and the approach to this will be to be able to do this at scale uh, within the country, uh, making it immediately available uh, to patients who want this in the country. And we're also going to do this at a cost on a cost basis. So in other words, we will manufacture in scale to together with the NRC, there's centers being a center being created to be, do manufacturing for the viral vectors and the vectors associated with gene therapy. And we would like to do this at cost for Canadian patients and then commercialize this around the world. So here was a, this is a key lesson for us. There was a key opportunity, a molecular understanding, clinical development happening in Canada. We had no control of the manufacturing. There was no manufacturing at scale in Canada. Uh, and as a result of the cost, of manufacturing that we had no input into, the drug was eventually withdrawn. We're now going back with an improved version, filling the gap in the ecosystem for manufacturing for gene therapy, and hope to be able to offer this for treatment for gene therapy at a cost basis here in Canada, uh, providing some uh, essentially recognition of the cost and the taxpayer commitment to gene therapy and being able to offer this. And this is being done in a very significant collaborative way with the NRC across the country. Thank you very much um, for having me. And I will actually not spend so much time on talking to you about the extremely exciting uh, times that I think we have ahead with CRISPR uh, genome editing as a potential way to what I believe can revolutionize uh, our therapeutic approaches to a number of different uh, genetic disorders. Uh, what I would like to spend the time on to, to foster some hopeful, vibrant discussion is around what is still needed for us to really move this forward in a broader sense. I think most of the participants probably know that we have currently <clears throat> one genome editing CRISPR mediated trial in clinical trial uh, for beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease and the preliminary results are outstanding and incredibly promising. But I think what we need to keep in mind is that we are using bone marrow cells that are then being exposed to the CRISPR technology and then via bone marrow transplant given back to the patient. But as we really try to think about genome editing therapies targeting different, um, <clears throat> different uh, organs, I think there are a number of questions that are still uh, need to be answered. So number one is um, there are currently a number of exciting gene therapy trials with exogenous gene therapy uh, going on in many different uh, disorders. And I think what's really critical and important as we approach the results of those is that we really share as much uh, of the lessons learned from these gene therapy trials, particularly as it relates to potential side effects and so on, so that we can think uh, in the most educated way <clears throat> about how we're going to implement some of the CRISPR trials because at the moment the vehicles that are being used for gene therapy and that are being experimented on in preclinical trials are very similar. Um, <clears throat> when you hear me get excited about uh, CRISPR as a potential technology for, uh, for therapies, then 
all of my comments are related to somatic uh, gene, uh, genome editing therapies. Um, and I think that the discussion around germline uh, genome editing is an entirely different uh, field and, and I think uh, even based on some recent results that most of you have seen, there's a lot of caution that needs to be taken into account as we think about the future of germline genome editing. But I do think that the time for somatic genome editing is at least close. One of the questions that often comes up are the risk of, of target effects. And, and the one specific issue I want to focus on when I talk to you right now is <clears throat> there are all sorts of ways and experiments that we can undertake to test and assess for off-target effects. But what's really not existing right now is to assess how our either animal studies that are limited in nature to begin with when it comes to off-target effects, as well as our in vitro studies on human patient cells eventually translate into a risk assessment of off-target effects in a human body. Uh, and I do think that as, as scientists around the world think about how we're going to estimate risk, that's a discussion that's still ongoing and not solved. What is the immunity against Cas9 as a protein that we will give to the body? There are various different studies that suggest uh, that there is no concern around this or a lot of concerns around it, but I think it has to be uh, taken into account as we move forward uh, with planning clinical trials. I do believe at the moment, while we are still almost exclusively limited to AV vehicles uh, as the delivery method, uh, I do think that it will be critical for successful broader implementation of genome editing therapies that we think about non-viral delivery methods that would potentially allow for a re-administration uh, of the drug <clears throat> as well as limit uh, any immune associated side effects uh, from the start. And then at the end, uh, the last uh, issue I would like to bring up, a lot of these genome editing therapies are the ultimate example of individualized therapies because we are looking for patient-specific mutations and patient-specific drugs that target these mutations, which leads us to the fact that in the rare disease world, we are generally fighting with uh, the realities that we often don't have many patients. But here we are finding ourselves, and we will find ourselves in situations where we really have just one patient and one drug for one patient. So there are a number of ethical considerations of how you conduct a clinical trial, an end of one clinical trial, where you cannot use the example of a number of oncology drugs, where you can take these, take these drugs and take them away. But I also think from an industrial point of view, and that has been my personal experience with our own research, finding somebody who is interested to take the academic research to the next level and work on a production of a drug that then could be tried in a clinical trial is extremely difficult because it may just not be financially viable for a lot of companies to do this. So if there has ever been a time to think about how industry and academia need to closely partner to, for the benefit of patients, I think it is around this topic. And I will stop here and hope we'll have a great discussion. Thank you. I'm going to be speaking today about CHART, which is an initiative at the University of Toronto to uh, bring uh, regenerative medicine to uh, the Canadian research community. Globally, regenerative medicine is changing fast. Canada is well positioned to be part of this through its leadership in clinical trials and relevant manufacturing capabilities. Around the world, hundreds of trials are being planned over the next few years. There are still, however, many uncertainties about the adoption pathway for regenerative medicine therapies from clinical, from fundamental research to regulatory review, manufacturing, reimbursement, ethics, and implementation. So while we do hope to, quote, break through, unquote, so breaking through is the theme of this symposium, 
the theme is perhaps a little too heroic from the, for the kinds of activities that we routinely do, and maybe a, a better paradigm for technology evaluation or health technology assessment is assembling patiently and carefully the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. The challenges in evaluation and funding for regenerative medicine products in Canada has led to the formation of a group in Canada, including members from Medicine by Design, which is a re regenerative medicine initiative at the University of Toronto, CCRM, Theta, that is the Toronto Health Economics and Technology Assessment Collaborative, and Loughborough University. In June of 2019, this group organized and facilitated a workshop entitled CHART, Challenges in the Adoption of Regenerative Medicine Therapies, focusing on the post-market approval challenges associated with adoption of regenerative medicine products. CHART was attended by 37 experts from mostly Canada, the UK, and the United States. The committee's goal for the workshop was that the proceedings could help define actionable next steps around evidence generation and policy maker engagement in the regenerative medicine space. And so our workshop was organized around th four major themes or paradigms of health technology assessment. The first is benefits and harms. The second is health economics. The third is patient-centered care. And the fourth is system feasibility. And I'm just gonna talk extremely briefly about each of these. Uh, the discussion that we had about each of these themes. The first session discussed how to evaluate the benefits and harms of regenerative medicine therapies. And uh, the, the, the discussion focused uh, to a greater, to a very large extent on the nature of the clinical data that is available to evaluate the benefits and harms of regenerative medicine therapies. And much of the discussion focused on the difficulties of, of com, uh, making direct comparisons between trial and comparator groups. Essentially, much of the evidence in this space is single arm studies in which we just look at what happens to patients who were, who were exposed to regenerative medicine therapies. And um, boy, we're having a lot of visual changes here. Um, and it, 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 in that way, it's, difficult to obtain a, a sense of the relative benefits of regenerative medicine therapy since there, in most of these studies, is actually no control arm. So that, that's probably the biggest single problem in evaluating clinical benefits. Oftentimes, randomized trials are not possible, and when they are, the sample sizes are small. The follow-up times are relatively short. And then, um, because in this space, cure is actually possible, which is not true of many health uh, care conditions, how to think about the notion of cure in the in the ID in the domain of regenerative medicine when follow-up isn't really long enough to assess whether cure is permanent. You know that this is this is a bit of a challenge. If it is, the magnitude of benefits may be very great. If not, uh, less so. So those are the some of the issues in thinking about the the package of benefits and harms. What about um, what about health economics? So that's the second major dimension uh, that is considered in health uh, technology assessment. So the feeling of the committee was that in general, um, economic standard economic evaluation methods were applicable to regenerative medicine and, and cellular therapies, but there were some caveats. So um, again, the caveats focused largely around how to understand health benefits in the context of the evidence being single arm uncontrolled trials, the need to extrapolate benefits as a key driver of cost effectiveness. And then a lot of the discussion in this committee also focused on the, the actual cost of regenerative medicine technologies. They're expensive and delivering them may actually require um, infrastructure changes that may not be captured in cost effectiveness analyses. So, the the other uh, the the other issue that triggered a lot of discussion in this committee was that the standard methods of uh, evaluating uh, econ the economic attractiveness of these technologies suggest that uh, they actually aren't for the most part cost effective. We reviewed some CADETH reports and, and the, all of the incremental cost effectiveness ratios for regenerative medicine technologies were above the commonly accepted thresholds. So dealing with drugs that for which we have incomplete information and, you know, by conventional metrics are not that cost effective, uh, you know, these, these pose significant challenges. 
I won't talk about the third domain very much, which is patient-centered care. I will, however, talk a bit about the fourth domain, which is system feasibility. Is the system actually able to take technologies on board? And we focused in this, in this area specifically on financing mechanisms. So the, the, the conventional reimbursement paradigm is that you essentially, essentially make a decision to either accept or not accept or adopt or not adopt a technology. But, you know, because these drugs are so expensive, promising, but so expensive and have such uncertain health outcomes, policymakers in this domain are exploring options for saying something other than yes or no, but some form of maybe with conditional coverage. And the options that have been uh, discussed in the past are include amortization that is spreading out the higher upfront costs over a period that reflects the time profile of the benefits things like pay for performance which requires tracking the payment and performance measures of success leasing dividing the cost over time and innovation innovative financing mechanisms from financial markets where for example a payer will set up a bond that another entity buys and the payer provides a return on investment so those are the <clears throat> four major domains and some of the issues that are relevant to uh, considering the evidence in those uh, within those domains. Um, we as a group felt that um, regenerative medicines really offer enormous promise in specific areas and you know show incredibly strong evidence of clinical benefit but uh, that, that does not mean that they are yet ready to be wide adopted in a widespread way. There are still enormous challenges. These fall into the category of evidence, research design and implementation, and not least fiscal challenges associated with bringing them into healthcare systems. Our group was uh, really interested in continuing to work in this area with scientists and policymakers to uh, continue to explore methods to bring regenerative medicine products into Canadian healthcare. And with that, I will thank you for inviting me to this committee. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Even if I'm the last speaker in this session, I hope to provide something um, uh, insightful. In fact, I've chosen, next slide, a right um, that very few people know about and uh, try to use the whole topic of gene therapy to, to show how this right can either support it moving forward or in fact might create what I call somatic conundrums. So the right to science dates back um, to 1947, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. When I went to law school, I didn't know about this right. And when I talk to human rights lawyers, they don't know about this right, but it actually exists. And it, it talks about the right of everyone, that means everyone, uh, to share in scientific advancement and its benefits and at the same time to be recognized if they've made any intellectual contribution, such as, you know, that would eventually be protected by um, intellectual property. Next slide. Now this declaration was actually, or this article, this declaration was incorporated into a covenant in 1966. And this covenant has been signed and ratified by 169 countries which means that this is, goes beyond a declaration to becoming what we say is legally actionable. You can ask your government if your government signed and ratified, what have you done about this? What's going on? Have you, how, how have you promoted this right to science? And we as Canadians can ask because Canada has signed. So again, you see the right to benefit and also the possibility of protection of IP. But what's interesting in this covenant is that you have the right to enjoy and the right to enjoy and uh, uh, these benefits can only be limited by law and can only be limited by law where it is for the purpose of promoting the general welfare in a democratic society. Next slide. So what does this have to do with somatic uh, uh, gene therapy? Well, I've named four conundrums, costs, cosmetic uses, children, coordination. I hope to sort of highlight some of the issues. Next slide. So the first one is cost. And I think you heard about this yesterday in Chris McCabe's excellent talk. You've also heard uh, Janet <clears throat> Rousseau explain in the um, expert panel uh, study of the Canadian Council of the Academies, all the questions and issues surrounding 
costs and equity and access, especially in a country such as Canada with universal healthcare system, which is a, a value that we all hold as Canadians. But just to comment on the last item on this, um, on this slide of cost, there are also um, costs to researchers, not so much in terms of you know, getting grants to pay to do this work or getting the hospital to cover it, but more the whole process of the approvals process is really complicated and long. And sometimes we still use terms like biologics, drugs, devices, and you know, moving towards a more elastic term that can keep up with technological developments called advanced therapeutic projects. But they still have to go to Health Canada. It's long, it's careful, it's cautious, and it's costly. Next slide. Also, uh, what we forget is, whereas it was particularly in pediatric uh, conditions where a lot of the somatic therapies are being used and for, for, for therapeutic purposes and, and, and hopefully will um, end the suffering um, of these children with these often rare or um, uh, diseases with high mor morbidity and mortality, there could be enhancement purposes, cosmetic purposes. If you're working with CF and, and, and you free up the lungs or you're working with a muscular dystrophy and you create muscle mass, you can well see why all those same therapeutic purposes could be uh, misused in other contexts. Next slide. So my, one of my main concerns since the field is beginning in um, um, chiefly in the pediatric domain is what about the children and their rights? Who speaks for the children? And how can we uh, um, maximize the use of their data um, now and in the future uh, while protecting uh, their privacy? How can we share? Because this is still very rare. Can we share across borders? You know, the successes, the failures, the, 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 um, the complexities of the uh, data sharing and I'm sorry, of the therapeutic process. And also for consent models, uh, we, we have all kinds of models that work in, in, in research, but are not necessarily made for the clinical uh, setting. And these are still obviously research uh, endeavors, but you can't re-consent a, a child at the age of majority for something um, that has already um, uh, become part of their of their um, of their uh, body and, the, and their being and their genetic uh, makeup uh, when they reach the age of majority they don't they don't have that choice it's the parents that make the choice and finally I mentioned under children I mentioned um, uh, maximizing um, their data but with somatic and one day if we get there with gene um, uh, germline editing there will be even with somatic intergenerational monitoring. There has to be a monitoring. Did the CRISPR technique, did, what's the long-term effect? Did, uh, were there any um, untoward uh, effects that weren't evident at the time of the intervention but become evident later? And what does this mean for a child to be followed up and, and the next generation to be followed up? And no one has really paid sufficient uh, attention to that and, and here with children, you have the right to science, but you also have their children the right to health, which is probably one of the reasons that um, somatic therapies are moving ahead. Children have the right to the highest attainable standard of health. It's as highest attainable. You don't have a right to health. And you could probably also buttress the right to science and the right to health by calling on the right of future generations. That's where the intergenerational monitoring um, uh, will come in. So this is this is complex. So that's another C. Uh, next slide. So finally, I know the next panel is going to talk about um, this this report. If we move from somatic and we learn the lessons from somatic, uh, the safety lessons, the efficacy lessons, the intergenerational lessons, will that um, lead to beginning uh, to work at least in research, if not in preclinical, in the hereditable, in the germline <clears throat> editing space. And that is where the model that was suggested recently 
for heritable human genome editing should one day clinical applications be considered uh, 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 safe and then in very limited conditions, which I think uh, we'll hear in the next panel, there is a need already now to put in place these three um, uh, international oversight bodies, entities, organizations. And I think we should start even with somatic doing this so that they're definitely in place when the, the germline editing uh, begins one day. And one is a, an, an international body, um, maybe that's where the data sharing will, will uh, begin, that looks at the science and advises uh, uh, and can put out recommendations for national countries who then make their own sovereign uh, decisions. But it helps to have uh, a, a, a high level body with the best science and not everyone trying to start um, from zero and not necessarily having that scientific capacity available to them. And this is really important um, in terms of avoiding what's called medical tourism and so on. Secondly, there should also be a, a place for debate, for, for um, international debate on whether we do want to go uh, further and or what's the difference between somatic and, and, uh, and uh, enhancement, uh, therapeutic versus enhancement and so on. And, and finally, and it's kind of a negative note to end on, um, we need a whistleblower mechanism. We need a place where those who are concerned um, can raise issues about what is going on uh, in their country, in their lab, or with their with their colleagues, a, a, a careful, cautious place, obviously, uh, that uh, would protect the privacy of all concerned. But the um, a lesson of the of the twins in China uh, that were born following the CRISPR method shows how many people actually knew, thought, or saw, and yet um, uh, never uh, knew where they could go with their uh, concerns about therapies that weren't uh, really therapeutic. So I'm ending on that note, and I think for Canada, it, it, it might be uh, the time to, to consider having this kind of a national body that we can all uh, participate in here in Canada, but also uh, together with our colleagues at the international level. So that is the way I think we can really use the right to science, um, the right to health, and the rights of future generations responsibly. Thank you. Um, um, they, they've really brought some, some really uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, crucial issues that, that, that uh, um, acad academia and, and government are faced when developing these gene therapies. Um, and, and I would say uh, in rare disease uh, uh, field, uh, uh, diagnosing these, uh, uh, these rare diseases is one uh, uh, important component, but then being able to very fast move from diagnosis to designing and developing treatments is whole other uh, issue. And then the, the third one, being able to produce these uh, uh, at GMP level in facilities across Canada. So, uh, what I would like to do is maybe invite uh, 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 Dr. Um, uh, 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 Ronald to, to comment a little bit on how do we integrate this, uh, uh, in a broader sense, uh, diagnostics and, and mostly next gene sequencing in, in children's hospital and how then we continue building that value chain from diagnosis to design and development of therapies two different big big topics the first one is that we have to finally move here in Canada to uh, <clears throat> repatriating and providing the opportunity that our patients who require a genetic genome sequence that this can be done in Canada and doesn't have to be done on a clinical basis uh, in the United States or anywhere else in the world I think we have made some progress, uh, but by and large, that's the first step we need to take, that we will do this here. We, we have the capacity, we have the intellectual, the technological capacity to do it, uh, even if you would se uh, select a few larger genome sequencing centers. There are a lot of people in Canada who can help analyze these genomes, and that's number one. So I hope we will be able to solve that within the next one to two years. 
if you then follow the chain towards the development of therapies, I think you're talking about a lot of really interesting questions that we have to ask ourselves about how to approach it. And I'm not sure I have a clear answer, but first, in theory, any, almost any genetic mutation might be amenable to a genome editing technology. Now, if you happen to either be a researcher by yourself who is interested in a disease in one of your patients, or you know a colleague who is doing research in this area, then you can share your patient samples with these individuals and you can do research and you can do the necessary preliminary, experiment, um, preliminary and preclinical experiments uh, that, that are required to move this forward. But what do you do with all these patients who have a very rare disease who ask you a question, do you think it would work for my child? It's a question I get probably at least asked once or twice a week now. And I think that's from a system perspective, a question that we should be thinking about what kind of almost like a high throughput uh, system can we put into place to analyze, at least in theory, whether a mutation is correctable. And then let me end with one last thought, which I think will be critical and which I think will be the question for the next 20 years, if not longer, to answer. And that's the question of a therapeutic window. What is going to be the therapeutic window of children who have a genetic disorder or even adults where genome technology is potentially uh, available or can be made available when is it too late to treat and when would we make a decision it wouldn't be worth to pursue this further? An incredibly difficult uh, conversation and, and also a question that we, for most of the diseases, really don't have an answer for. Thank you. Uh, Michael, do you have a, a perspective on how do we achieve perhaps more integrated Canadian uh, uh, effort in both diagnosing and then uh, uh, creating a, uh, an environment where we can advance therapies much faster. Thanks for that question, Danica. Um, I think the Glibera story illustrates a massive gap that's not just about gene therapy. It's about vaccines, it's about antibodies, and it's about the the absolute gap in manufacturing capabilities in Canada, full stop. You know, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, when you look at Glibera, we were able to do the discovery, the de early development, but then had to uh, essentially partner uh, uh, in Europe to do that. It's not just that. If you look at antibody, the first antibody approved in the world for COVID has come out of a small Vancouver company called Absalera. But Absalera um, had no ability to manufacture, so they partnered with Lilly, and Lilly is manufacturing. And Canada now is re getting this antibody back, but it minute doses, uh, primarily because of this massive gap. Uh, and of course, in vaccines, we see the same thing. So there is an overall systemic lack of manufacturing capability in Canada. I'm really thrilled to see the NRC right now working to try and create a core in terms of manufacturing at scale that can try and produce these because when you manufacture at scale, the cost goes down dramatically and you can start providing it to Canadian patients and taxpayers who have supported all these efforts. So it goes for antibodies. I'm also thrilled to say that uh, this government has uh, provided support for manufacturing infrastructure development for antibodies now in Canada. NRC is doing this for uh, uh, gene therapy, and it's not just for Glibera. Glibera will be the first, but this will be a platform for many others. And then also for vaccines, we're hoping that this gap can be filled for the future. So it's a systemic gap that I think, uh, in principle, NRC is starting to accept, uh, integrate. Uh, and it's a very Canadian solution, integrating the basic work, the clinical work with the manufacturing in a very unique solution, which will provide these reagents at low cost to patients and in the end,
support lives and create a cost-effective solution. Thank you. Uh, um, I, I echo that, that sentiment and uh, um, on behalf of NRC, we, we really uh, uh, saw that as, as a key gap when, when creating the, this new program uh, and really uh, bringing Canadian environment to uh, uh, capabilities of producing some of these gene therapies or these advanced therapies at clinical scale at, at least uh, to be able to initiate clinical trials and, and, and uh, uh, deploy some of this uh, uh, in a limited number of population in Canada that suffers uh, a rare disease. But then there is always a step, a step, further step, right? So uh, uh, once we test this in clinical trials, what, what do we do next? Uh, is, are, are commercial models or public-private partnership models the, the way to sort of ensure that uh, these therapies uh, uh, are not just available through clinical trials, but, but really become more uh, uh, available, not just in Canada, but globally. So how do we, like, what, what are your thoughts around uh, uh, this, I don't want to call it commercialization model, but but some a model that, that's maybe alternative to typical commercialization. Well, I think Michael, we have a unique. Start? I'll just start <laughs> and then over to you, Ron. But I think we have a unique opportunity. Uh, you know, when we look at the need for these therapies, they're global. I think there can be some uh, uh, interaction between the companies doing the commercialization and Canada to find some payback to the Canadian taxpayer who supported these to provide these drugs at cost plus tiny increments in an effort to really uh, and then to for the rest of the world to have appropriate commercial models that are appropriate for commercialization in the world. So this is very unique, um, but I think we can have a Canada made solution that gives our patients more access and is reflective of the contribution of federal and provincial governments to the early recovery and the development and helping to provide infrastructure support to this. So I think we can have a unique Canadian uh, response to a big Canadian problem. Thank you. Ronald? Well, I, I will just add to, uh, to this. I agree with everything Michael said, um, what I said earlier. This is the chance to really foster some strong goal-oriented academic and industry collaborations that can by itself already reduce the cost for the development of some of these drugs. Um, <clears throat> and I think some of this is already happening, but I think it's happening more and more. And it is probably now the best opportunity that we have at hand to, to, to really do this at a larger scale. Thank you. I'm just going to check very briefly whether we have other two panelists back in um, uh, and uh, um, whether we can proceed now with, uh, uh, with their presentations uh, uh, on, on technology uh, evaluation and, and legal issues. Are we okay? No? Okay, it seems that, that our technical difficulties <laughs> are still persisting. So we are uh, 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 nevertheless going to sort of continue uh, um, um, on, um, on the theme of what are, what are Canadian opportunities and we've all, already touched upon that. I would also like I'd to, like to, to protect... I'd like to ask for your comments because as we look to do this at scale, we'll need Core, you know, what we need to do are these core facilities where it takes serious investment to be able to do this at scale. So we can't duplicate this in each province. We'll need national facilities that support this. Uh, and the NRC, the unique uh, uh, framework, which, which is national in scope, that could provide this for the whole country. And then the next question would be, once we have this in place, how we define what the next priorities for these facilities are 
and how we choose those because Canada has particular burdens in terms of genetic disease that are quite unique based on the history and the formation of Canada from Newfoundland to Quebec to other populations to populations in Manitoba where there are diseases that are very high frequency, sometimes highest frequency in the world and are often neglected because they don't occur in such deep frequencies in other parts of the world. So we have some unique problems that you need unique solutions. Yes, so uh, uh, I'll, I'll comment a little bit uh, uh, on that. I mean, for us, Liberia was a, a perfect example because, uh, again, LPLD is, is very Canadian disease. The, the frequency of that particular disease is, is much higher in Canada. Um, I, I think our initial analysis really provided um, a, a bit of a, a understanding that there is a gap, and we knew that in, in uh, uh, being able to manufacture these therapies. Uh, so within the program, we uh, are working on setting up clinical facilities to GMP scale that's sufficient again for clinical trials. In many cases, these facilities uh, uh, will be able to undertake some commercial uh, uh, or some sort of commercial type uh, development for very small uh, uh, number of patients. But really the goal on our side was, was to be able to enable uh, sufficient GMP batches for uh, uh, running and, and enabling clinical trials. Uh, can Canada go beyond that into more of a, a large-scale commercial production? Possibly yes, and I think again, COVID example is giving us uh, a, a real lesson on, uh, um, uh, you know, like lack of, of uh, sustainability uh, in the country on, on uh, in by manufacturing of vaccines and, and other advanced therapies. Uh, but I think we we have to thread. Uh, uh, really in a way step by step to, to take this opportunity to, to make sure that we integrate the system a bit better to understand what what kind of innovations we can actually bring into clinical trials themselves in these rare diseases uh, 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 working with health canada working with uh, uh, other stakeholders to um, uh, to improve the way uh, the, the clinical trials are, are run uh, and, and the way uh, uh, the subsequent sort of step is uh, more clear in terms of uh, uh, perhaps ultra rare diseases being something that the government uh, um, um, stake uh, or the government can have a, a larger role, whereas some, some uh, bigger disease areas could could be addressed more in a, um, a classical sort of partnership with, uh, uh, with, with pharmaceutical industry. So um, right now, I think uh, uh, our goal is to start building clinical capacity for GMP and, and hopefully then start um, uh, uh, building on that uh, with maybe more innovative models for both clinical trials and deployment of these two therapies. Uh, You know, Danica, in light of that, it's it's just helpful for the audience uh, to understand what scale means. If you do it in small volumes, the costs are sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars for a single dose. But when you get to thousand liter capability in production, you can reduce that by 10 or 20 times. So being able to do that at scale can really reduce the cost of production so profoundly that I'm hoping in Canada in the medium term, obviously not in the short term, that we can do this at scale to reduce the cost even here so that it becomes truly accessible for all patients who need it across the country. And, and that, that's uh, absolutely right, and especially in AAV based gene therapies. The, the scale uh, uh, brings the uh, uh, price per patient or, or cost per patient of goods at, at least much to much lower level uh, uh, than uh, doing smaller batches. So uh, scaling up uh, from clinical to more of a commercial side, that this whole other step that, that's going to be necessary. Uh, uh, 
uh, going forward and enabling Canadian deployment of, of gene therapies uh, and manufacturing of, of these gene therapies in Canada. So uh, I'm going to uh, uh, perhaps ask you a little bit more uh, uh, around um, um, what, what is like, a, a, again, to, to sort of re-zero in, what are current Canadian strengths? And I, I because we say Liberia is our example, is our first in line, but from your perspective, and I'm, I'm quite uh, sure that you are very much involved in this, what is the pipeline, what is the strength of Canadian academic research that can provide the pipeline of this innovative medicine uh, uh, going forward? Ron, do you so want to I go, think, please? Sure, would be happy to. So I think that if you are looking at the strength of the ac uh, academic intellectual capacity we have here, it's it's tremendous. I I think um, there are so many outstanding scientists right now working on gene and or genome editing. Uh, therapeutic approaches at the preclinical level, uh, including animal experiments, that I think that there's no shortage of, of, of a pipeline. I think the, the issue is, uh, the, 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 the problems are what we've talked about before. How, how are we going to not just create the capacity in Canada, but how are we going to create the relationships to take what we do in our laboratory and move it to the next steps to really identify the path of how we get into a clinical trial. And I know some of this sounds obviously like an old problem and to some degree it is, you know, we always talk about uh, translational medicine and getting stuck in between the laboratory and, and the clinic. But I think particularly for the gene and genome editing uh, academic pipelines that are currently existing it, it's it's a tremendous hurdle to overcome um, but i hope we are on the right path here to 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 do that it would be a shame if we couldn't leverage in canada the tremendous academic potential we have danica i'll add you know when we look at canadian strengths um Canada has been a world leader in gene identification from cystic fibrosis to Shen Matas dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy, and keeping on going. Uh, and this really happened in the 90s as a result of the Canadian Genetic Disease Network where we shared resources. So we had a particular Canadian collaborative response to some of the issues that were faced. And we need that same spirit now. Uh, where we don't have to duplicate resources in every province that are very expensive, but we share across provinces. Canada has unique uh, strengths in molecular genetics, in uh, discovery. Um, we're not that strong on the translational in terms of clinical development, but we're getting better. Uh, and I think ways to combine the strengths across the country uh, and provide healthcare to uh, very uh, uh, patients who are suffering so much would be a major strength. And we have unique populations, unique approaches uh, based on our history uh, and where people came from. And they came here bringing their genetic mutations with them and often stayed somewhat isolated, which resulted in significant aggregation. But Canada has been a world leader in the discovery of genes. We've done some of the early work in translation. There is a gap in translation in healthcare to our own patients in this country. Uh, and that's where we need to now build further. Uh, but this will need a government support in terms of building some of that capacity. But we have amazing strengths in discovery and also amazing strengths in a collaborative and collegial spirit across this country. We are all united by a common desire to do things for our patients here first uh, and uh, we don't want to have our discoveries exported and then re-imported, just like lumber used to be, uh, at higher costs that makes it more expensive for Canadian taxpayers. So we want to discover, 
translate and give it to patients here and then commercialize for the world. Excellent, and, and thank you, Michael, for this uh, uh, very inspirational uh, uh, commentary. Uh, uh, I think uh, that that's really good that, that we are uh, very confident and uh, uh, we have identifiable strengths that we are aware of what the gaps are. I, I think uh, the, the CCA uh, uh, publication and report really uh, indicated that uh, uh, the path forward will be through integration and collaboration with different elements uh, uh, in, in the Canadian ecosystem, and I hope we will be able to work towards that uh, uh, towards that uh, uh, goal uh, as well. Uh, um, the other element, perhaps, is this uh, uh, stewardship uh, uh, of uh, public investment in this. Uh, uh, and achieve that uh, uh, really public-private partnership that is uh, uh, is going to bring impact for them. Uh, I think we are coming to, to an end. I, my, my screen is pretty broken. Uh, 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 it seems that we still have these technical difficulties in the background. I have to apologize that we didn't have the opportunity to give... Yes? Hello? So do we have do we have other panelists join or not? I uh, again I have to apologize. We have a uh, uh, we have some technical difficulties. We didn't have the opportunity to give uh, the stage to two other panelists. Uh, but I hope uh, uh, that the uh, uh, discussions that we had was uh, sufficiently engaging and. Uh, uh, we will uh, uh, collect the questions uh, uh, that came from the audience and try to answer that uh, uh, a bit later on. And then with that, I would like to thank uh, 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 Michael and uh, uh, Ronald for joining and, and giving some commentary on this Canadian context for uh, gene therapies uh, uh, and rare diseases. Thank you. Thank you thank for you. having me. Thank you.